Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. You know me as host of the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, but when I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a book about my experience called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. Now, if you own or operate a business, ask yourself the following marketing-related questions and be honest with your answers. Are you generating fresh new qualified leads on a daily basis? Is your website generating enough sales? And if not, do you know why? Is your advertising effective? Is it predictably and reliably making you several multiples of what you're spending on it? And lastly, are you consistently communicating with your email list? Or do you have an email list of prospects and customers, but you have no idea what to say to them, how often to say it, or how to make money with this list? If you need solutions for these marketing problems, then you need to book a one-on-one marketing strategy session with me. After this strategy session, you'll know how to speak to and make money with your email list, how to use your website to attract customers and clients who are ready to buy from you now, and how to sell your goods and services for top dollar and at much higher profit margins than your competition. Listen, stop hoping things will get better on their own. Hope is not a very good business strategy. Instead, book a marketing strategy session with me by going to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing and find out if your business meets the five criteria you need to qualify for this service. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. I'm with a rock and roll legend today, Mark Chatfield. And he actually looks like a rock and roll legend, too, if you, if you get to see him. Anyway, Mark grew up in Columbus, Ohio, where he and a few friends formed The Gods, G-O-D-Z. Anybody that's a baby boomer knows that band. They were signed to Casablanca right out of high school, and they went on tour for two years, headlining and opening, sharing the stage with acts like Angel, Judas Priest, Cheap Trick, Blue Oyster Cult, The Ramones, Triumph, Head East, Mahogany Rush, The Babies, and The Outlaws, just to name a few. In 1979, the Gods disbanded and Mark formed the band Rosie, which won a national battle of the bands in Florida. They beat out 39 bands around the United States. In 82, Mark was invited to audition for Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, and as they say, the rest is history. Uh, He was Seger's touring and sometimes studio guitarist from 1983 to 2011. In between tours, he's also toured with Michael Bolton. He's done studio work. He's played locally with Rosie, and he opened the world-famous Cowtown Guitars Vintage Guitar Shop and originally in Ohio, relocated to Vegas. His musical influences include 50s and 70s rock and roll. He's an avid collector of vintage guitars, which I just saw, like, I'm sure just a snippet of what he has in his uh, home studio, and I was salivating. And uh, rock and roll memorabilia. When he's not playing, he loves to ride his motorcycle, spend his time with his wife and his stepdaughters. As of 2017, he's back playing with Bob Seger. Mark, thank you so much for coming on. appreciate your time. Hey, my pleasure. And he's a good guy to talk to, as you'll see. Um, All right, so you're like 18. You get signed to a major label, and you're opening up for guys that I assume were some of your music heroes. This had to be both exciting, I would imagine, and overwhelming at the same time. What was the good and the bad that came out of that experience? Um, you know, honestly, there wasn't too much bad. Oh, that's uh, great. You know, we were, you know, being, um, we actually got signed, I think, when I was, I was 20 when we got signed. We, we, uh, the gods were a bar band uh, for a while. I mean, with, with, getting a record deal, you know, was our intention. Um, but nobody, nobody even dreamed it would happen that fast. We'd never been in a studio. We'd never done a demo ever. Um, the, the band started off different than, than it, uh, than it morphed into for the record. Um, we originally had, uh, another drummer. We had two drummers. The band had two drummers and, um, a keyboard guitar player. And one of the drummers and the uh, and the keyboard slash guitar player uh, were both from Parkersburg, West Virginia, and they were killed in a car accident. Oh my God! Um, on their way to Parkersburg to pick up our promo packs. Wow! So um, and that that's before we got signed. We were still a bar band, you know, at that point playing a few originals and and 
some great covers, but some of the goofiest fucking covers you probably ever imagined. <laughs> um, and, you know, because it's all about if you're going to get jobs in bars, you got to play stuff that people can dance. To. Sure. So yeah, we were. Uh, you know, yeah, we played some goofy shit. But um, enter at that point uh, a guy that had been playing with with our bass player Eric Moore and our drummer Glenn Cataline. Uh, his name's Bob Hill. But he and Eric were also together in a band called the Capital City Rockets, who did an album for Electra Records in the early 70s. Um, I don't know if it's still in print or not, but uh, fun, fun fact, the singer on that record is uh, a guy named Jamie Lyons, who was the singer in the Music Explosion, who did a uh, little bit of soul, wow. which is now on a commercial on TV. Uh and, you know, that band did one record. It's kind of funny. Bob, one of Bob's big influences was Creedence Clearwater Revival, hence Capital City Rockets, CCR. There you go. That's where that came from. So Bob oh, Bob enters cool. the band and uh, actually adds a whole other flavor to the band because Bob has, uh, has his own writing style. Everybody in the Gods wrote songs and everybody in the Gods sang lead on songs. We kind of... Eric was the front man. Eric Moore, the bass player, was the front man. Uh, but... We all, you know, took turns singing lead on songs, uh, mostly, you know, well, songs that we wrote. So, you know, the beginning of the tour was, uh, I, you know, it was I'd never really been on a tour like that. I'd only done, you know, bar things. And it was, um, uh, you know, it was just a blast. You know, I was just turned 21, I think. And, uh, you know, we we had the world by the balls. Um, you know, you had to, you had to get used to, we weren't running the show anymore. You know, we were a support band and we hadn't done, uh, before we got signed, we hadn't done too many support gigs. We opened for, uh, we opened for Iggy pop. Wow. In Columbus, uh, which was, which was a blast. Cause I'm was, and still am a big Iggy pop fan, a uh, Stooges fan. And we were so big in Columbus. Um, and, to this day, I don't know how that happened, uh, but we were so big in Columbus. We had national acts opening for us at the Agora. At the Columbus. Agora, wow! That's... Yeah, which is now the Newport Music Hall. But yeah, we had um, just for example, we had Budgie from England. Yeah, I know. Uh, they they came and opened for us for for two nights at the at the Agora, and you know we're a band without a record deal. We're not not signed at all. So that was uh, it was kind of a phenomenon. Um, the, the worst part about the gods tours were the fact that when we got our advance, somebody in the band, I think it was Eric, got this harebrained scheme to, uh, or harebrained idea to buy a motor home instead of having a tour bus. Uh. So we had this motor home that we owned that we bought brand new and the generator never worked. It was just. It was fucking miserable. Too hot in the summertime, too cold in the wintertime. And uh, if I had to think of a bad part of the tour, that was it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. So overall, it, it sounded like it worked out pretty well for you guys, even though you were a young kid. Well, 21 yeah, it, is a young kid. It, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it did. Like I said, we had, you know, it was kind of like go with the flow playing, you know, playing in front of big audiences every night. It, the tour started out just with us and angel. And then, you know, occasionally somebody else would be on the bill like, um, uh, head East. Um, gosh, I, you know, it's been so long. I can't think of some of the bands that were on those bills, but then that tour morphed into us and angel and, uh, Blue Oyster Cult was the headliner. So so the venues got a little bigger and, uh, you know, playing playing some of the places that we'd already played on tour with them. And we'd actually done a Blue Oyster Cult date prior to that tour. Just um, you and them? Just us and them in Columbus at the state fairgrounds. Their ticket sales, from what I was told, uh, the ticket sales weren't going exactly where they wanted to be, and uh, so they added us to the date, and the date sold out. Wow! So you were that you were like just a, a tremendous regional magnet. Absolutely, in, yeah. in Columbus and Cleveland. That's those wild. Were the two, that, those were the two big uh, big cities for us, and I, I know I 
if, if I have to think of a story, there's there's a couple of stories from that those tours. The first one, the first one, I, well, I have two Blue Oyster Cult stories for you, if you want me to do them now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The first one is the first time we played with them, and and I think they might have been adverse to us being on the tour with Angel after that. Um, we did our set, and the crowd just would not stop. So we literally were off the stage for ten minutes before we came back on because oh, cool. the crowd would not stop. And uh, the the God's legend, you know, the the urban legend, which is actually a true urban legend about us playing in jock straps and underwear, uh, showed its scary head that night. <laughs> um, Bob and Bob and Glenn or Bob and Eric both wore like bikini panties. Nice. I wore a fucking I wore a jock strap that was <laughs> dyed red with a sequined waistband. Nice. Um, that my mom did for me. Uh, so out there with my ass hanging out, there's actually a picture in Cream magazine uh, from around that era of us playing at the Agora from the back um, with, you know, my ass cheeks hanging out there playing in a jock strap with red platform knee high boots on. If anybody so, has these pictures, send them in to me at uh, everyone loves guitar.com contact form. <laughs> yeah, they're there that I want to say exist. They, they were, they were in print. That's a so, good Facebook um, uh, viral they, thing. I actually, I think the, the caption of the picture was called was said, ye gods caught with their pants down. Ah. But, once again, you know, we're in a national magazine without having a record. That's before we had a record deal. So that's my first Blue Oyster Cult story. They weren't very happy at us, first off, coming back on the stage after all that length of time. Um, and uh, and then coming out in, you know, various modes of undress yeah. at that point. Uh, flash up to late 1983. I'm playing on tour with, with uh, I'm on tour with Michael Bolton. And um, we we are playing in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, in a uh, in a baseball stadium. So we we come off the stage, and um, uh, the crowd is you know the the crowd response is really really good. Now this is when Michael Bolton was a rock and roll guy. This is during you know the Fools game and um, everybody's crazy uh, era before he you know went more mainstream R and B. Um, they told us we couldn't do an encore, so we went on and did one anyway because the crowd was gone. The, the guys, the Blues are called, the guys in the band are really nice. Some of their crew guys, you know, were, I don't know, just took their jobs a little too seriously. So we go on stage and we start, I think we started bashing out rock and roll by Led Zeppelin or something, and they, 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 they turned off our power. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> turned off our power mid song. So, no love lost with the Blue Oyster Cult crew guys. Yeah, that's guys really weird. And really nice guys. Yeah, they're really uh, good musicians. Those guys. I, I would, they, I would think they would be. They, they are, and you know, and their stage show during that period was was pretty cool because that's when they, you know, they were doing lasers and stuff, and it was, uh, you know, they were they were selling out, you know, twenty thousand seat venues or fifteen thousand seat venues at that point in time. They were huge. Mm, yeah, they were a big. Band. Um, so you know that that was. Uh, you know, that that was our time with, with Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, the guys in Angel always treated us really well. Their their uh, their management treated us well. Their crew treated us well. And the guys in the band were all pretty groovy guys. Don Brewer, who's the drummer from Grand Funk, I noticed that he produced your first album. I was curious how that relationship came about if, and if there's any backstory. And how was it working with Don? Um. You know, if you want to, you want to talk about working with your idols. You know, I, I was, and once again, am still a huge Grand Funk fan. Yeah. You know, growing up in high school, that's one of the bands you know that that we covered uh, in in the bands that I played in. I loved Grand Funk Railroad. Still do love Grand Funk Railroad. So meeting Don Brewer was like, you know, you're you're almost speechless. Um, what happened is. The gods got signed on live performance. So a couple of Agora gigs, our management at the time, and a couple of disc jockeys from uh, uh, oh from uh, QF wasn't Q, was it QFM? No, it was WCOL FM was our FM station there. 
you know, they knew what was going on with us. So they were calling people and saying, hey, you got to come see this band. So several labels came to see us, um, one of which was a label started by Jimmy Einer called uh, Millennium, which was owned by Casablanca Records. So Jimmy comes to see us one show. Then the next time, the next time we play, he brings out his brother, Donnie Einer, who ends up, you know, going on to uh, be the president of Columbia and then Sony Records, sign a gazillion, you know, really great artists. Um, Donnie and Jimmy decide they want to sign the band. So they are friends with Don Brewer because Jimmy had produced one of the uh, Grand Funk albums, the later Grand Funk albums. So they, Don had wanted to go into producing some after, uh, after Grand Funk broke up. So they have him come out and basically, uh, basically, you know, Donnie, Donnie Einer and Donnie Brewer come up to our dressing room after the show and, uh, offer us a record deal. Wow. Just, and, just, uh, just like that. Yep. Just on live performance. Wow. In a, in a, in a, we, we used to hold the house. We, us and Queen who played the Agora, I was actually at the show. We held the house record at the Agora for years and years and years. And, Nobody's even quite sure how many people, but it was so over capacity that you could not fit another person in the place. And I'm not exaggerating. There used to be a line a block long outside the Agora when we played, when we got done playing, because they would let people in as somebody would leave. You know, they'd get too hot in there or whatever, and they'd leave. And then they let somebody in, and people waited that long to try to get into the shows. Are there, ste- are there seats in that place, or is it a stand stand-up? Um, there are, uh, there are seats upstairs in the balcony, um, that, but downstairs, the dance floor is sunken in there. That's standing room only. Then on the sides, if there's a, you know, a lower key concert in there, they put tables and chairs on the sides. Mm. Uh, but for us, no, there were no, there were no tables and chairs on the sides. It was all standing. And then, you know, the upstairs it was, there were seats, but it would, was standing and seats. Wow, that's awesome, man. So, so it was your when your your experience in working with Don. I mean, I guess it was you didn't really have a base of comparison at that point, but you felt it was a good experience overall working with him. Yeah, we um we we well the 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 fascination with Grand Funk gets even better because we recorded it at Grand Funk Studio. Oh wow! In, in Michigan, at the it was called the Swamp. Very cool, and, man. Um, so we, we recorded up there with a, a guy named Mark Stebbins was our engineer, who I'm still friends with to this day. Um, and we uh, we we went pretty fast, you know. We we kind of did it like Grand Funk did their records. We basically, you know, I took a bunch of stuff up there to record with and stuff. And Don goes, you know, just play it like you do live. So basically. You know, all of our basic tracks, we tried to get, you know, quickly using all of our stage gear that we use, playing it just like we played on stage instead of, you know, trying any fancy schmancy shit. Hmm. Um, The one thing, you know, that later on I discovered was sometimes normal and sometimes not. We recorded all that stuff without even a scratch vocal. What does that mean? That means that nobody sang along while we were playing the songs. It was came in afterwards? Yeah, you, you, yeah. That's why Grand Funk used to do their stuff too. I guess that's how why Donnie had us do it. Plus, we were playing pretty loud in there, and you know, there's no bleed through the vocal mics. But but some of the stuff was a little tricky um, because of timing things, because some things were cued by vocals. So that became just a little tricky, uh, but but not too bad. Um, we recorded a couple extra songs that didn't get on the record, uh, so we get done. And Donnie had a hard time. We didn't really have any studio work ethic at that time. Mm. So, you know, we would go out to the, we were staying at the, the Howell Michigan Holiday Inn, which was the only hotel close to there, <laughs> you know, and we get done recording and Don liked to start in the morning. So we'd get done recording and we'd go to the Howell Holiday Inn bar, you know, and get, get trashed all night long and then, you know, want to get up at noon or so. And that wasn't working for Don. Right. So he made us promise that we wouldn't go out and get drunk every night, you know, after the studio. 
and he said, you know, if you guys can get two basic tracks done, you know, a, a day here, we can get this done and, and I'll buy everybody a bottle of whatever booze they want. So he kind of, kind of bribed us with that. So we, uh, we ended up, you know, we ended up getting all that stuff done. We leave the studio, we go home and we'd done one of our, our ending song at the time was a song that's on the first album called Candy's Going Bad, which is a golden earring song. And, you know, there used to be a big fanfare at the end of it. And it was a really popular song. Well, we're thinking this isn't an original. We're not going to play this, put this on the record. So uh, we get back down to Ohio and get a call from our manager gets a call from the record label. They say, why didn't you record that song? Go, well, we didn't write that song. Well, guess what? get right back up there and record that song. So we had to load up the van again <laughs> and uh, drive back to Michigan and do that song. We were, we were pretty pissed. So that song is literally a one take song. We went in the studio. So the song on the record that you hear is what we did on that one take. And that was uh, pretty much it. And they actually came out really good. So you go, when you do somebody else's song, this is like an sort of an admin question, but I just don't know how that works. It's somebody else's songs. You have to get permission from them to do the song how does that work technically you're supposed to but you really don't have to as long as you list the writers okay. and you know pay the publishing company from sales and things like that okay i get you i get you but so, technically yes you're supposed to get their permission and i don't know if you know somebody you know the powers that be called the you know called their publishing company or whoever actually owned the song at that point so yeah, they, they seemed, you know, we never, there were never any repercussions about it. And then they pay, I'm, I'm I'm just curious about this from the business standpoint. If there's 10 songs on a record, they divide, how, is there a formula? Because, like, let's say you had a big hit on there, you can't divide by 10 because maybe 50% of the people are buying because of that big hit. How, is there a, some sort of actuarial formula they used to work that out? or? Well, it you know, yeah, it is. And it, it goes by, it, pretty much it, Back then there were singles, so it was pretty easy to figure out, you okay. know. But, yeah. but on the record, you know, if an album sells, it really doesn't matter what song's getting played more at that point. The album sales are the album sales, and it gets split up between the writers and the publishing companies. Okay. Um, you know, I just had to do that uh, by having a song on the Seeger album, um, the new Seeger album. Um I literally had, I used to have a publishing company a long time ago that was associated with Rosie. And because um, we had a big falling out with our manager, I didn't want anything to do with that publishing company anymore because I don't know what's going on with that. So I formed a new publishing company, um, which was my option. I could either go through Bob's publishing company, which means I have to split any publishing money with him, or form my own company which means i get all my own publishing money and then i just split the writers royalties if there are any writers writers sure i may make a tank of gas out of this i don't know sure i get Uh, you depends on on the sales but yeah the album sales you know it 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 just gets split up you know however many publishing companies and writers and things like that interesting thanks i I was always i didn't know how that worked yeah, well, I, I didn't either. And, and in the gods, we didn't know how that worked. We sold our publishing rights to that, the first record, which is still in print. And from what I've been told by some people a few years ago, that that's, it's been in print since 1978, um, that, that it went gold, that it sold enough copies to go gold, which is why it's never been a cutout and it's still in print. Though we don't know because we sold our publishing rights to that record for 5000 bucks total. So they paid you a flat fee for all the future stream of revenue that would come out of that, and you guys took it? To the publishing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we've never made any money from album sales on it either. What? So, Why is that? Um, because it's changed. The, the company's changed hands so many times, the paper trail ends, and nobody can figure out where the money has gone. Holy shit. Well, you know, we're not alone. Uh, uh, tons of, you know. Yeah, like, yeah artists like that and we just signed a bad deal didn't have good management and um or anybody to show us the way with that and you know it is what it is yeah which was not uncommon at that point in time i would imagine no and even before that you know if you were in the 50s you were getting fucked every day yeah so. yeah yeah <laughs> by your friends quote unquote uh yeah. 
So after the gods, you form Rosie, and Rosie's off to a good start. Yes. Okay. Um, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, okay, I was going to say, and then you get the audition for Seeger, so Rosie had to get put on hold, I guess, basically? Yeah, Rosie, Rosie went through a few transformations. Um, t- two of the guys from the gods quit the band toward the end of the band. And uh, we replaced them with uh, the drummer and the other guitar player, both left. And we replaced them with two other guys. We had some songs. Um, Eric, Eric Moore and I went to, to uh, the, the, we got traded to Casablanca. Millennium went disc, total disco at that point. You know, they had Miko and uh, I don't know, a couple other disco artists. So we got traded to Casablanca. It's so funny hearing that word even disco yeah it, yeah <laughs> I, well you know during that period of time you know if you were a rock and roll band you were getting eaten up by disco yeah and, and even, even country rock be, was becoming really big at that point in time too so it was a bad business to, to kind of be in wrong place at the wrong time as opposed to now <laughs> right it, exactly exactly yeah yeah i hear you um but they uh traded us to Casablanca. So the second album we did came out on Casablanca. Um, uh, I can backtrack here. Don was hired to do the second, to, re- to record the second, or to produce the second album with us. And we went to, uh, we were in, in Bearsville Studios in Woodstock, New York. I know exactly where that is. To, uh, to record it. Beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah. Don, Don got fed up being stuck between us and, and the record company again, and we were totally disorganized. Um, that didn't really have any good songs per se, uh, cause we really hadn't had time to write anymore. We'd been on the road most of the time and not to mention, you know, our, our, our mental and, uh, and chemical states at that point. So Don left the studio, he quit and left the studio and Eric Moore, the bass player ends up producing the record, which is the record's terrible. You know, a couple of the songs are okay, but the record itself is terrible, so it tanked. Uh, we went on tour with, um, uh, we did some headlining dates, and uh, then we went on tour, a tour of Texas with Triumph. Uh, and this is probably, I don't know, early 79. So Eric and I fly to California to play some new songs for. Uh, uh, for Casablanca and they ended up passing on it. So we lose our record deal. And then, you know, we just kind of fade into oblivion with these two new guys. And, uh, Eric decided he wanted to go on his own. And, um, so the other two guys and I formed what was to become Rosie. Oh, uh, okay. So hold, and, on, hold on one second. When that, in a situation like that, it sounds like if you guys had, like you guys didn't know what you didn't know. You you were kids, didn't know what to do. Were disorganized. Would would it have mattered if you had a handler, at, like uh, you know, like somebody to like kind of kick your asses at that time, or were you guys just so sort of like off in your own world and doing your own thing that it didn't matter? No, we if we would have had someone that can could control us, um, our our problem our problem was our manager was as fucked up as we were. Okay, uh, we were all we were all drunks. Uh, quaaludes were still very popular then. Um, You're bringing up all these all, words from like that are that have been floating around my brain for thirty years. That I haven't even heard disco quaaludes. <laughs> oh yeah, well we were all. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, Columbus, Ohio was the quaalude capital of the world, yeah. and uh, we, you know, we we had prescriptions for quaaludes. Uh, thanks to our manager. Oh, wow. Who, who was, uh, who was uh, you know, and I'm not going to mention his name, but um, he was wow. all looted out. And then, then we were we were introduced to cocaine while we were on the road. Um, we really hadn't gotten into it very much back in Ohio. It was more like a booze and booze and lewd kind of thing. Um, and then we got man- then we got introduced to cocaine and our manager was as bad as we were, if not worse. Wow. And so, yeah, we didn't really have any direction. We we had nothing. We had nothing but ourselves, pretty much. And all we knew how to do was party and go play some rock and roll. And that was pretty much it. Yeah. Mm. Wow. And I'm sure that story has repeated itself hundreds, if not thousands, of times during oh, yeah. that time frame. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, some guys weathered it better than others. Sure. Um, sure. you know, I, it's funny that you mentioned that cause I'm, I'm just now finishing up the, the book that uh, Van Halen's manager wrote. And, um, you know, and I'm reading the end parts here about, you know, Eddie's, you know, abuse at that time and, and his brother and Alex's abuse. And I'm going, man, that's me. That was us. You know, all of that is us. Now, they were fortunate enough to, A, have great songs, um, and B, have someone there, you know, they had a management team there that was, that was, that could control that to a certain extent. And, and, you know, when it got to be too much, you know, they could, they could control it to a certain extent. So we did not have that. And mm. in hindsight, you know, I kind of wish we would have, but we didn't. So it is, it is what it is. Yeah. Right. You can't look backwards like that. No. So. Then you get the audition, you get the gig with Seeger, and you've been with him on and off basically for like 35 years. Yes. Um, I get a call from uh, December uh, December of 1982. Um, I get a call from Don Brewer, and he goes, hey. And I said, hey. I hadn't talked for a long time. He goes, well. Seeger, Bob Seeger fired his guitar player and his drummer left, and I'm playing drums for Seeger now. And uh, we want to know if you want to come up and audition. So, uh, so I go up and audition. I, I need to backtrack here a little bit. Um, during right before the God's second album, Grand Funk, you know, Grand Funk had broken up. So Don Brewer and Craig Frost and Mel formed a new band called Flint. They did an album on, it's on uh, Columbia Records, and uh, they had me come up and play on the record, because Don always really, really liked the way I played guitar. Okay, I was going to ask about that, because I was like, wow, what a benevolent thing for Don to do, because he yeah. couldn't fucking deal with you guys, and you know, he either you had something on him, or he really had some love for you, one of the two, man. Well, he did. He loved the way I played guitar, and he loved my guitar tone a okay. lot. And, um, so they called me to come up and play on the, uh, play on the Flint record. And that's where I met Craig Frost, uh, the keyboard player. And he and I just bonded. We just playing, you know, we were like kindred spirits. Mm. Um, we bonded. He's still my best friend. One of my best friends to this day. Uh, so they asked me if I wanted to join Flint at that point. And, you know, I, I didn't. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to do the God's second record. Um, and, you know, things were looked like they were kind of happening because it was right at the end of the first God's tour. And, you know, it looked like things were, you know, kind of happening for us. So I wanted to pursue that. So I didn't join the band. And uh, uh, Flint did their one record, did some dates, then they broke up. Uh, record really didn't get any, any airplay. It's a good record. Um, I'm on it, and uh, you better get ready to pick up some names. I'm going to drop some. Um, uh, Frank Zappa plays guitar on it. And Todd oh, Rundgren God. plays guitar on it. None of us were in the studio at the same time, though. Um, so you know, it's a pretty. It's actually a pretty cool record. Yeah, those, but it didn't do anything. That's and weird. then, so I get this call in 1980. Flash up to 1982. Don calls and says, "Well, Craig and I suggested you for an audition for." Seeger thinks that, you know, we think that, that you would fit that bill very well. So I have about a week while they're auditioning other people. And uh, Craig is kind of filling me in. He's calling me every day and telling me what songs are being called, you know, for, for audition songs. Oh, that's really cool. It was very cool of him as kind of a sneaky thing. But what I did on my own and, and uh, you know, Back then, this is, you know, where you're either learning stuff off of, you know, vinyl records or maybe tapes, which is a bitch, you know, and in hindsight, it's a bitch trying to learn that stuff, you know, and, and hear the details and things like that. Um, but I took it upon myself to learn a lot of the songs off the brand new album, which was called The Distance, hmm. uh, which had just come out. So I go up for my audition. Um let me back that. Let me back that up. It, it's in the middle of. It's in December of 1982. 
Rosie knows I'm going to go audition for Seeker. We have a gig in Lancaster, Ohio, at this place called Charlie Horse, which is the size of Billy Bob's Texas. And the bar is bigger than Billy Bob's Texas. This place is mammoth. And they do mostly country uh, country rock acts there and country, you know, co- country headliners. But Rosie has a really big following down there. So we're one of the rock acts they have down there. So we we're playing. And as usual, you know, I'm I'm two fifths of vodka into the night and um, play the gig. And right after the gig, I load up my car and I have to drive from an hour south of Columbus all the way up to Detroit to audition the next day in a fucking blizzard. Wow. It is snowing like you can't, you know, it's that thing where you're driving into the snow and the flakes are coming at you and it's hypnotizing you. I'm hypnotized. Um, how, how many hours is that without snow? Uh, three and a half. Okay. Close, close to four. But, you know, we're talking, it's, you know, I leave at three o'clock in the morning drunk on my ass in a, uh, in a, in a blazing snowstorm. I, I get up to there like seven in the morning. The audition's not till noon. So I check into some seedy hotel, um, you know, off of Woodward, the first place I see. And I can't sleep at all because... I'm afraid somebody's going to break in the car and steal my stuff. Sure. So I go to the audition, and um, and the the shoe in for me was first off. I walked in and automatically started getting along with Chris Campbell, uh, who once again he and I are still great friends. And Chris He's is the, Chris is Bob's bass player. Okay, has been since 1969. And, you know, I already know Brewer, and I already know Frost, and you know we play through some of the songs. And then a couple of us, for some reason, we're like getting ready to break something. We start jamming kind of on on some of the new songs. And that got Bob's attention. And because uh, I was the only guy that came in that knew the new songs. So that kind of, you know, helped me. That probably helped my way, you know, into getting the gig. Yeah. So And it just, you know, it just fit. We all played really, really well together. And that that started this 35-year relationship. Yes. That's awesome. That started the relationship. What made you... So it's weird because it sounds like you know you had a good work ethic and your drink substance abuse stuff did not impact that, which is like very... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like two polar opposites. Like, you, you know, you, you maintained... Well, they, they, there's the there's the the phrase functioning alcoholic, right, right, and uh, and, and that's what I was. I was a functioning alcoholic. I mean, don't, believe me, there's times when you know there are times when it just gets to be too much and you can't function. But um, no, I you know it gets to be second nature, you know, and, yeah. and a lot of guys were like this, you know, sure. you just go out, you just go out, and you know, you just know how to play. Hmm. Um, you know, some are, some nights are better than others, but some nights are better than others sober too. <laughs> right, uh, right, one hundred percent. But yeah, I was. Uh, you know, yes, I could. I could pretty much. Uh, I could pretty much function like that. Now, could I function in my day to day life and relationships and things like that? Not, not so much. You know, that it's got to. You know, it's got to. It's got to. Uh, it's got to fall somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that you know that part. That part not so not so hot. Get it? Um, okay. Let me just let's take a one quick step back. You had you p- opened up for a lot of excuse me really cool bands, and I was curious if you either could share a story or maybe did you learn something from some of these guys, uh, either performing performing wise, playing wise, or you know even life lessons, business, uh, like Judas Priest, for example. You know. I don't have anything good about Judas Priest, and, and the reason, <laughs> well, the reason or bad. The the reason is, um, it was we were playing at the Palladium in New York City, which turned into a club after that, but it used to be a concert venue mm-hmm. um, with seats and stuff on Fourteenth so, Street. Yep, yep. It was us, Judas Priest, and Angel. It was Judas Priest, like second American date ever. And I, I didn't really talk to any of those guys um, other than walking up to uh, 
who's the blonde guy? KK Downing. Yeah, it was KK and Glenn Tipton. I thought they were yeah, both blonde. I both blonde. KK, I thought. I, I walked up to KK Downing, and I said, "You're Michael Schenker, aren't you?" <laughs> and, and how I remember uh, that, you know, uh, but, but I remember, I remember doing that. And oh my god! I, I remember also a couple of the guys from from Kiss were at that show too, but without makeup. I remember Paul Stanley sitting on the side of the stage. Um, but uh, other than that, I really did not have any interaction with them. <laughs> what was it? Did he have any response when you said that? No, he, he goes. Um, he goes. No, he, I think he said no wrong band or something like that. Oh, okay. So he was kind of cool about it. He, he was okay yeah. about it. But you <laughs> you're know. Michael Schenker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> cheap trick. They're, they're, cheap trick. Cheap trick opened for us. Are you kidding? I am not kidding. Um, at Music Hall in Cleveland, Ohio, June 16th, 1978. Holy crap. Um, I remember that. I, I remember that date because it's a month after my birthday. Uh, I was just about to ask you that. The, yeah, that's the only reason I remember it. I think I still have a, a clipping. Uh, the bill was Trigger, a, band, a Casablanca band called Trigger, did one album for them, Cheap Trick, and then The Gods. And I really didn't have any interaction with Cheap Trick during that gig. Um, it's uh, I, I knew of them though. I knew who they were, and I knew Rick Nielsen had a you know giant guitar collection. And um, oh, even back I, in the I, day, he had a big. Go- he was that was his thing. Oh yeah, yeah. His family owned a music store, um, so he's been collecting guitars since he was a kid. Okay. So, you know, he had a, and he used to carry a lot of really cool stuff on the road. And I remember looking at his guitars and at that point in time, I was probably using I was using newer fancy schmancy, you know, stuff at that point and I remember feeling kind of I don't know. Um I I really didn't want him to look at my guitars cuz his were so much cooler than mine at that point. Even though I, you know, I had some good stuff at home, I just didn't I wasn't using it at the sure. time. I was more into using, you know, bc riches and the dean had just come out and stuff like that even though he used a lot of hamers but he had a bunch of cool vintage stuff so i really had no interaction with them at that point in time but i had seen them many times after that and talked to them about this and uh rick and i are not we're nielsen and i are not you know bosom buddies or anything but we know each other and same with uh tom peterson who i've sold several guitars to over the years hmm. and um and robin zander and i've run into them at some shows and they always have to you know hound me about the gods and you know you know the gods aren't around anymore and we still are but <laughs> my my cool my 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 funny cheap trick story comes many 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 years later in 2000 and i'm gonna say it was the beginning of the 2011 tour seeker tour and we were playing in uh, we were playing in Florida and it's the only small venue we played. I think we played the Hallandale hard rock, which, you know, yeah. a lot of really big bands play. Mm-hmm. So we were playing there and, uh, he was at the show cause he lives in Florida. So we're, we're going to, to do the encore, the first encore, which is, um, night moves into Hollywood nights. Yeah. Night moves into Hollywood nights. So night moves, I play acoustic on. Then I have to do a real quick switch to Hollywood Nights for electric guitar. So I go over to give Andy my tech, my acoustic guitar, and there's Robin Zander standing there with my electric <laughs> guitar putting it around my neck. That's and, cool. Uh, I I didn't know what else to say. One of my favorite cheap trick songs is uh, Tax Man, Mr. Thief from their first album. And um, I looked at him and I said, man, I tried to get Bob to learn Tax Man, Mr. Thief, but he wouldn't go for it. <laughs> started laughing about it so that's my my cool cheap trick story. that is cool story so, man the guitar um and, oh go ahead and then one more the ramones once again we really that was at the aragon ballroom in chicago i don't know if you've ever been there no but the the stage and that i'd played there a couple other times the stage in that place is really high in the air and i don't do real well with heights and uh that place always intimidated me but we just, I don't even know how we got on that bill. And we flew in to do it. And the first, the opening band was the Fabulous Poodles. 
okay. who didn't go over very well at all. They were kind of a uh, glam punk band. Mm-hmm. You know, they were more like uh, like the Robert Gordon, you know, kind of, uh, you know, dress up punk mm-hmm. kind of thing like that. Um, they didn't go over very well. And then we didn't go over well at all. The crowd hated us. They just hated us. We didn't want to be there. I, I, I barely remember the show. I was so drunk. We, um, we flew in for the show, and the flight from Columbus, Ohio to Chicago is only about 45 minutes. Hmm. In that 45 minutes, I drank the plane out of Coors beer. <laughs> um, completely drank, the, drank, out of, drank them out of Coors beer. We're stuck in Chicago midtown traffic on the way to the venue for sound check because it's like, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon and we're stuck in Chicago midtown traffic and I can't hold myself. I end up jumping out of the taxi cab and in the middle of rush hour traffic, end up taking a piss right in the nice. middle of public Lakeshore Boulevard at five o'clock in the afternoon in Chicago. Nice. Um, I didn't get arrested. Uh, thank God. But, um, uh, you know, that's my fond memory of our Ramones show, other than the fact that I can say that we opened for the Ramones and 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 I had seen them. I saw the Ramones at CBGB in 1978, the uh, beginning of 1978, which is one of the highlights of my, you know. Yeah, that is my, cool. Of my scene band's uh, career. <laughs> Do you know CBGB's is now a John Varvatos clothing store? Yeah, I heard that. I, you know, after it closed, it's kind of a. I, I, I know somebody that's been there, though. I guess John Vavardos Bar, Bar, has a huge collection of old um, of Macintosh uh, hi fi gear, and he has it all in there. Oh, that's cool. And I know somebody, I haven't been there, um, but I know somebody that has it said it's pretty, pretty darn cool. But that night, we weren't playing. We were on the road, but we had a day off. I saw the original. Um, everybody in the band and the gods was mad at me at that point. Um, so I went by myself and saw the, uh, the original cast of Beatlemania at the Winter Garden Theater. Yep. And then I jumped on the subway and went down to the, to, uh, to CBGB at Bauer, and, uh, Bleaker and Bowery and saw the midnight show of the Ramones. Ah, that's very cool. And I remember Mitch Weissman, uh, from the Beatles show who played Paul McCartney in the original, uh, Beatlemania show was at the show too. But, um, yeah, it was a very, very, very cool night for me. Yeah, that is awesome, man. Let's talk about, you mentioned a couple of times your sobriety. You've been sober now, I think you told me, since September of 2003. Yeah, 14 years. Right. So, 14 change. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Sincere Thank congratulations. You. And I was wondering if you're okay to talk about this journey for a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. So Absolutely. what was your drug of choice? Um, you know, I started doing drugs and drinking at a pretty early age, right at the beginning of, uh, like, um, Right at the beginning of high school, uh, at late junior high, early high school. Um, at that point in time, we were we were only drinking. Um, uh, the the guy that I played in a band with, his mom had some old beer in the basement. We used to drink warm beer out of these beer cases. There, it was pretty pretty nasty. Uh, but then then we discovered Boone's Farm, um, so we all started drinking Boone's Farm. But my the first drug I ever did was speed. And I'm not going to get into a huge, long story, but when I was 14 years old, I ran away from home in Columbus, Ohio, with a girl named Debbie Weber, who was my girlfriend at the time, um, the summer of uh, being 14. I don't know what year that was. And uh, we hitchhiked from Columbus, Ohio to San Francisco. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty but ambitious. We could make a movie about it. Yeah. It was uh, quite, quite a journey. And the people that picked us up, uh, somewhere around St. Louis, we ran away from home, and I was I was introduced to, and God be my witness on on my mother's life, we were picked up by by four people in a Volkswagen a <laughs> Volkswagen van. Uh, um, that is a true story, and uh, so we traveled with them for quite a while, and uh, they I, they were snorting some speed, and we did a little bit of that, and then. Um, uh, they were smoking pot, which I smoked pot with them, but pot was never my drug choice ever. Um, Interesting. I never really got along with it. And it's kind of funny. I, I you know, I, I drew the line at, at cigarettes. I never have smoked a cigarette ever. That's interesting. And, um, well, I drew the line somewhere and that's where it was. There you go. So when we got back, um, 
it, the, the, the worst part of that whole journey was not the hitchhiking out there. We get out to San Francisco and, you know, we want to go where the hippies were, which is which even when the hippies were at Haight-Ashbury, it was a it was a dump. And it, it was and when we were there in 1970, it was a total dump. I mean, it was terrible. It was like Skid Row. So I didn't we know scared. that. It's interesting. Oh, yeah, it was terrible by then. Um, we, uh, you know, we didn't have any money. We didn't know anybody. So we and you're 14 our parents. Yeah, exactly. Holy shit. Um, and we finally called our parents, said, guess where we are. And they had no idea. So they're probably know? shitting themselves. Meanwhile, well, the police, the police in my little town, Grove City, thought that I was holed up at some, in somebody's garage, like outside of Grove City. OK, you know, that's what they'd heard. So that, that, that they were they were they were. You know, they were slick. Anyway, um, they uh, we had to take a Greyhound bus all the way from San Francisco back to Columbus, Ohio, which was by far the most miserable part of that whole journey. You probably had 300 stops. Oh, my God. It took forever. Mm. And it was just terrible. Just terrible. Wow. But um, uh, we um, when, when I got back home, I... I uh, Everybody, a lot of people in my school had started, and I, I hung out with a lot of older older kids in my school, um, and they were all doing acid, which was actually pretty good back then. So <laughs> my first drug of choice in, in school was acid. Most of my, you know, on any given day, probably a third of my school was tripping at school. Holy shit. I've never so, heard yeah. That was your drug of choice, acid. Wow. At that point in time. It, it's, you know. Wow. It, it, so how many times do you think you dropped acid? Oh my God! Well, to give you, I can't can't even tell you, but I'll give you an example. Me and my my friend, who I'm going to leave, my friend Bill. We'll just say his name's Bill, um, which is really his name. He and I, he and I bought a hundred hits of yellow Berkeley acid for sixty dollars. I don't even know where we got the sixty dollars, um, and and we're gonna um, we're gonna sell it because acid was two bucks, you know, like two bucks a hit at mm-hmm. that point in time we didn't sell any of it we did it all so over the Holy period of about a month we did it all i you know i wow. I, I want i want to say you know it's got to be well over a hundred well over man you're lucky your brains aren't fried i, I did that one <laughs> night i went to a grateful dead concert and a bunch of us did that and it was great but that, that was some deep intense shit man that's not i mean and, it, well, and and you know and back then it was i mean it was good it was good the problem the problem with acid was and probably still is if people do what's called acid now it's never done when you are <laughs> oh very good i've never heard it you, put like that but yeah oh yeah you, yeah yeah you oh that's all that. yeah it's like an all-nighter man but what, but yeah well sometimes it's it's longer than that. You know, sometimes it lingers into the next couple of few days. Um, so that, that started off being my drug of choice. And then, um, uh, then, then the Quaalude kick hit and, uh, Quaaludes in my school were a big, big deal. You know, once again, on any given day, a third to half my school might've been on Quaaludes at school. Wow. So, and that's, they started off being, uh, we, we started off with orange ASs, which a lot of people don't even know what those are anymore, but one was on the cover of cream magazine many, many years ago. Um, and then it went to, uh, that company went American standard went out of business and it started being roar seven fourteens, then lemon seven fourteens. I remember that. I remember those, the roar. So yeah, we, you know, and, and we would, um, you know, we had some people that were getting Mandrax too, which were basically all the same thing except mandrax came from mexico somebody mm. was going down to mexico you could buy them over the counter down there so wow. uh bringing back mexican mandrax or you'd run into french mandrax and things like that those weren't foil packs holy so shit. that stuff was that stuff was rampant so through school a lot of quaaludes a lot of drinking and then by senior year i started doing speed um i'm not even quite sure why but white crosses and uh and still drinking you know a lot of us drank at school we had um you know i was in the band program there uh in our in our band room um there was a bathroom in there and we were pretty unsupervised in there there was a band room there was a bathroom in there that that had a lock on it 
So we used to sneak booze in and, you know, hide it in the instrument rooms and, and you, you know, yeah. and you drink booze and, and uh, you drink booze, do drugs and have sex, you know, in the locked bathroom in the band room. Wow. <laughs> so a lot of that going Holy around. Holy shit. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the days. I, it's amazing to me that I even graduated from high school. Yeah, that's what. I, so this is just high school. So what? Yeah. How did this progress after? Was it just more of the same thing, or? Yeah, um, I the the speed thing, you know, still hung around a little bit, but uh, but quaaludes, you know, qua- quaaludes were were the drug of choice and alcohol um, for quite a while until cocaine came into the picture. And then once cocaine came into the picture, it was pretty much just booze and cocaine. Gotcha. So this went on for quite a while. What what was bottom for you? Like like what what was the trigger to say fuck? I got it. I I can't keep doing this. Well, I tried to stop. There, there. You know, I'm one of those people that could. You know, I could quit drinking for a week if I needed to, or something, or if I was in trouble with a girlfriend or a wife or or you know, anybody I could straighten up for a little bit. Um, like I said, functioning alcoholic. Mm. Um, I tried to quit. Well, I did quit twice. Um, once somewhere around, uh, I was kind of forced to quit somewhere around 19. I'm going to say 88 or so, um, 88 or 89. There's year. You know, I have a I have a really vivid memory of a lot of stuff, as you can. I mean, yeah. you know, some dates and things like that are, are just ridiculous that I, that I can remember this stuff. But there's a really gray period for me um, in the late '80s. You know, I was at uh, I, at that time I was at the peak of my addiction. Um, I have to back up here a little bit. Uh, I rejoined. Um, you know, after all the Seeger stuff and all that, I came back and Rosie continued on uh we became we stayed a band uh we did an album um after the ep that we did uh for the battle of the bands thing that we won but we did an album and the band was hugely hugely popular very very popular um probably for length of time more popular than the gods were Mm. you know we were selling out multiple nights at the al rosa and stuff and and basically you know we were the thing Mm. um we uh, uh, ended up. I don't. I don't even remember the circumstances, but we ended up breaking up, and I ended up going back to another version of the Gods, which was me, uh, Eric Moore, the original bass player, a drummer named Kevin Valentine, and uh, Freddie Salem from the Outlaws. Okay, uh, was the band. They had done an album uh, prior to me being in it, uh, back in it on Heavy Metal America. Uh, which is called I'll Get You Rockin', which is a pretty good album, actually. Um, so I go back and, and rejoin rejoin the band, and we're getting ready to move to California to try to uh, try to get another record deal. Because, you know, we've got some good material, and the band had a following at one point in time. And um, uh, very suddenly, my dad gets killed. Wow. Uh, my dad Sorry was a that, my dad was a was a very athletic person. He ran ran marathons and things like that. You know, he ran every night. Rain, shine, snow, didn't matter. He ran and he got run over uh while, Sorry. He, was, while he was running. Two days before I was supposed to move to California. So um I stayed around and stayed back, you know, for the funeral and everything. Meanwhile, everybody else went back out to California and I didn't want to go. I just didn't want to go. I didn't want to abandon my mom and stuff. And she and my sister, uh, you know, insisted, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do here. Um, go. So I went out there and, uh, I just started, um, you know, I, I was just, con- I was always drunk. I'd wake up and drink vodka. And uh, there was a guy that lived above where, at the apartment where I was staying um, who was a, a Coke dealer. And uh, one, I sold one of the guitars that I took out there that was, you know, fairly valuable. And uh, so I had enough money to party on. Hmm. And, um, you know, I was doing so much cocaine that, uh, 
one night I just started not feeling very good and had to go to the hospital. My my blood pressure was like, you know, 200 over 160 or some Holy crap. ridiculous thing. So um, they, they made me chew up the blood pressure medicine. I remember that. So uh, the guy goes, you know, if you don't knock this shit off, you're just you're just going to die. So so I stopped. I stopped at that point and I came back home, uh, moved back home um, because the band wasn't going to get signed. There's, you know, the stories from that go on and on and on. And I don't don't, you know, don't want to bore you with all that. And some of it I honestly don't remember very well. So I went back home and um, went into AA. I didn't like it. And uh, <laughs> wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. Well, I'm one of those people. I'm thinking. I'm sitting around looking at all these people. I'm going, man. I'm not near as bad as any of these people. Like people do. So no, you, uh, it was funny when you said I didn't like it. Like like what? You know, I've, I know loads of addicts who've gotten you know sober. <laughs> like who likes going? It's like who likes going to AA when you're an addict? Day especially like well, day yeah. one. You know, it, exactly. Like, yeah. You know, but you know. Uh, you know, uh, addiction is an equal opportunity employer. It yeah. does not discriminate. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so I didn't like it, but I thought, you know, if you can stop for a year, then, uh, you know, then maybe you can come back and, you know, and regulate what you're going to do, like a lot of people do. Mm. And uh, so, uh, you know, I stopped for a year and then I started uh, I started drinking again on on New Year's Eve and uh, you just went cold turkey on your own and just stopped yes yeah after the doctor incident I did um, uh, you know I, I think I was you know a lot of it had to do with 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 losing my dad I think and, and I'm then sure. the, yeah. and then the um, uh, and, and then the uh, the change of you know relocating you know it was just too much mm. it was just I didn't realize it was too much, but it was too much. So I was self-medicating to the point of killing myself, you know. So, so I quit for a year, and uh, uh, that turned into up to 1995. And um, I was losing a relationship uh, that was near and dear to me um, over my drinking and drug use. So I quit again, and I thought, well, you know, once again, if you can quit for a year, and I, I had didn't seek any help or anything, you know, uh, if you can quit for a year, then then maybe now that you're older and smarter, we can try this again. Sure. So I quit for a year, and uh, actually, I was I was on tour. That was right before the '96 Seeger tour. I mm. started that tour sober. Um my relationship never got repaired like they, like most of them don't. Uh, and I came to realize that it was over, you know? So I said, well, fuck it. You know, I'm not going to get her back. So I might as well drink again. So we were staying, uh, we were staying at the four seasons in Beverly Hills. Wow. And, um, I walked across the street to a liquor store and bought a bottle of, uh, either Stoli or kettle one or something. And I didn't drink it that day. We played L.A., flew to Vegas the next day, and we're staying at the MGM Grand, and I drank that whole bottle of vodka up in my room warm. Oh, God. And uh, then came downstairs, and, oh. and I remember coming downstairs and remember not being able to talk very well because I ran into some people that I knew, and I, I couldn't talk, so I went back wow. upstairs. So then I so that basically started me back on drinking again until uh, – and until 2003. <laughs> and what was the trigger then? Um, the trigger then was, um, I was going through yet another divorce, but that wasn't the trigger. Uh, that was your second it, divorce. No, fourth, fourth. Okay. Third, third, third. Okay. third. I've been married four times now. Um, currently married, you know, yeah. to a wife of, I don't know, eight years. We've been together for 14 though. Um, the, the reason I moved to Las Vegas was to a move my store here, uh, move Caltown guitars here, but I met somebody on tour and I moved here to have a relationship with her. So, um, and that's where you live now in Vegas. Then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I moved here in 97. Okay. Got married in 2000 and, uh, 
uh, we stayed together until 2002. I knew the marriage was going to end, and partially it was because my drinking. My drinking was more important than our marriage. Sure. Uh, and I really the good thing about the good thing about when I moved to Vegas in '97, I didn't start doing blow here. Uh, it would have killed me because you know you don't have to go to sleep here. You know you right. can stay up 24 hours a day and do it, do it, and and it and it would have. I'm sure it would have eventually killed me. Um, but I had started doing it again before. Basically, I would leave my shop, and I would drink all during the day anyway. And I would leave my shop, and I would go drink full glasses of vodka. And it fi- ended up finding a, a Coke dealer, uh, doing blow and playing video poker. Holy that, shit. So basically you just repeated the cycle, just adapted to the new venue. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh. So our marriage was ending, but it ended on a very friendly note. We used the same, uh, we had nothing in common, never did. Um, we used the same lawyer. Uh, we just split everything out, uh, put the house for sale. Yeah. And uh, I moved out, moved into a different, a different house that I rented until we, until we sold the house. And, um, the bar that I used to go to called favorites. I, I sat there on that Friday night, which was the 19th and of September and had my last full glass of vodka and knew that I was done. Um, this is like it, right it, after the divorce was finalized or something or right after you moved no, out. No, no, no. We weren't even divorced yet. Nope. So and, uh, I did, decided at that you... point that, and, and I hate to say these cliche AA things, but I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I really was. You know, I, I hadn't really, I had, I had also what's called a high bottom. You know, I still have my shop, you know, did I lose a lot of the store money gambling? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I did. Uh, I, uh, I just couldn't live like that anymore. You know, got tired of being hung over, got tired of, uh, I just got tired of feeling that way all the time. You know, the guilt the not being able to not being able to to have a relationship, you know, all of those things were, were my bottom. Um, but, you know, I didn't lose my job. I didn't lose all my money. Um, you know, I lost over, over the years, over the years I did, you know, over the years, I can't tell you how many guitars I sold to pay for the, you know, the night or week before that I binged in Columbus. Sure, sure. Um, you know, many, many times. But uh, that that was it. I just knew that I needed. Uh, I just knew that I needed a change. Um, so the next the next day, I drove to uh, to this church to an AA meeting, and in, um, close by, or was it like, close by? Okay. Close by in, in Old Henderson. I live in I live in Green Valley, which is newer Henderson. In Old Henderson, I drive to this church, and. Uh, the meeting's not far from, you know, it's 10 minutes from starting and there's one car there. That's it. And I'm going, you know what? I am not ready for this. You know, <laughs> I can't do this. Now let, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. One of the other reasons, uh, and it's not a bottom, but one of the other, um, uh, one of the other factors for me stopping drinking is, a, I've never had a DUI or OMVI or whatever you want to, whatever yeah. state, you know, calls them. I've never had that. I've never been in an accident drunk ever. Never heard anybody like that. Which was a small uh, miracle. Thank I've goodness. I've been pulled over twice uh, drunk and gotten out of it both times. Not even trying to get out of it. Just nobody ever did anything. Um, so I, uh, it was getting to a point here and it happened in Columbus a lot, but it was getting to a point here where I was blacking out driving home. Holy you know? shit! And when I talk at AA meetings, when I when I when I'm like a guest speaker or something, I always I always joke and say, you know, I was so drunk that I would have to shut one eye just to see double. <laughs> and uh, and, it, and it's true. And and that started scaring me. Yeah. You know, I'm one of those people being a functioning alcoholic. You know when to pull the reins in sometimes. You know, you don't let it. That's not saying you never let it get out of hand because you do and do stupid things, say stupid things, you know, uh, cause a lot of carnage on the way. Sure. Um, 
to other people that sometimes you don't even realize that you're doing it. Uh, it's just because you're being what you are. Um, but I knew, I knew that if anything that would happen to me since I'd gotten away with that for so long was going to be a biblical proportion. So I went, you know what? Let's, so let's in other words, talk. you just thought like there's a lot of negative karma going on out there. And if it ever comes back to you, you're totally fucked. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and just getting that, just getting, you know, picked up for being drunk is bad enough. Yeah. But, you know, God help you if you get in that, you know, I feel so bad for people that kill somebody or maim somebody and having to live with that for the rest of your life. I, I just had a, I just had an awakening. I just decided it was time to grow up. So I don't go to this meeting. Oh, so you get to there as one car, you turn around. I turn around. So the next day is next day is Sunday. So on Sunday morning, I call I call the I call the the um, uh, uh, the the AA um, main office here, and they give me a list of meetings. So I decide to go to this meeting at a place called the Meeting Place, which is over off of Tropicana. It's at ten o'clock in the morning on Sunday. I walk in there. I don't know anybody, and I'm feeling kind of weird. I sit against the wall. And in walks my, at the time, uh, my stepmother-in-law. <laughs> Wait a minute, your stepmother-in-law. So this is, it's my, it's my, my wife's, it's my wife's father's. Oh, second wife, your second wife's wife. stepmother, your wife's yeah. stepmother. Yeah, stepmother-in-law. So she's my stepmother-in-law. Wow. Okay. I had no idea she was even in the program. But no you, clue. okay, so you, this is at the tail end of that third mar- uh, third marriage. Yeah, well, we're separated. Okay, you know? we're okay. separated, and I'm living on my own. Okay. at this point, and uh, and uh, so she walks in. I went, you know what? So I finally, I have somebody to talk to. She introduces me around to some people that I need to meet. Um, all, ironically, all three of them are have passed away by now. Or wow. now, um, one of them was my sponsor. And, uh, so that got me started. And they, I said, you know, um, I have a shop, you know, I have time. This is not a good time for me on weekdays and stuff. So they told me about another meeting over here closer to my house that I could make in the mornings. So I started going to that place is called GVG and I started going to that and, uh, that's pretty much it. How often did I, you go to meetings in the beginning? Um, every day. Oh, you did. That's pretty. Yeah. Every day. And sometimes, you know, a couple, a few times, twice a day I go, I did a night meeting too. Um, I really wrapped myself wow. into the program and the guys that I met really helped me out. They were really insightful. Um, uh, one of them was, was actually a little younger than me and the other two were a little older than me. And, um, you know, it was a, uh, it was where I needed to be at the time and the things I needed to hear at the time. And, uh, I've stayed in the program ever since. Now the urge to be an asshole has not completely left. me. (laughs) So, you know, that's still a work in progress. It's a work in progress for all of us though. I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, You know, it's now I'm in AA now more, not, not for the, not so much for the not drinking, but more for the life lessons. Mm, And, and it comes, it comes with it. You know, and and I can help if I can help other people in there by telling them my story and what I what I went through and, you know, all those kind of things. Then that's then that's great. You know, I I, I still go to meetings on a regular basis. Um, I have uh, my sponsor died. I don't have a sponsor right now, but um, I have several friends in AA that I talk to on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, it's all good. All good. Wow. What a freaking journey, man. I'm, I'm really happy for you. Well, thank you. That's a tough. Battle. You know, it's it, it's funny. You know, uh, well, I, I can't bust anybody else's sob- sobriety. I mean, you're not supposed to. You know, that's why it's anonymous. Yeah. But um, you know, a lot of the people I hang out with, and a lot of people in my industry, and, and in my situation, my band situation, are sober also. Yeah. And um, uh, it's I find that it's become. You know, I talk to people on the road. Uh, and I know a lot. I know a lot of guys in road crews and things like that that people won't even hire them if they drink. Not everybody's like that, but they will not hire them if they drink or drug. Mm. Um, you know, sober. Sober has become the new dressing room cocaine 
Interesting. In, in the older bands. But it's, it's uh, I, so I have a buddy. He's been sober, I think, about eight years now, and his life has really turned as everybody's is who is really heavy into it. You know, his life's turned around, and so uh, he and he's in L.A. and he goes, "Craig, come to my fucking meetings, man. You can meet so many guys for your podcast." <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's funny, when I was living in Hollywood, (laughs) when I was living in Hollywood and I got sober after the hospital incident, I started going to AA there, and I went to this church on Melrose that was the who's who of movies and rock and roll, man. It was the coolest thing. (laughs) Oh, God. Uh, But yeah, it's, and you know, and I, I, I do know, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people in big bands that are in the, that are in the program, and um, and for this and that, you know, not all of them, once again, lost everything sure, or, or lost anything other than losing their mind and not being able to have a, uh, a, a, a sound productive relationship with anybody, including themselves, including themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Which um, is the most important thing, man, because you, you, you know, you can't have a relationship with someone else if you're not good with you. I mean, no matter what right. some shit's going well, get... to, man, what a story. I really, um, thank you very much for sharing that i really oh, appreciate that right. i'm really glad that that uh that, that is 14 years it's, it's, it's far more entailed but you know we would be oh, here until it, thursday yeah <laughs> no 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 but that was it was really um it, it's it's funny because you know when i get when i get asked to speak at aa meetings um a, a couple of times a year you know you're supposed to only speak for like 40 minutes you know maybe yeah about 40 minutes and then you know field questions I always have a problem with that. You just my first time warmed I went, up. Over the, I went over the hour, you know, telling my whole life story and all that. But but I've I've finally gotten it whittled down to about fifty minutes. So did you have like was there a history of that in your family? No. Interesting. No, my parents didn't drink. Um uh I grand I had I had an alcoholic grandfather, um oh. or great grandfather. Then I had an alcoholic grandfather, but he's not related to me blood because my mom was adopted and uh, um okay so but he was he was an alcoholic he was actually a very very early member of aa in ohio um he was a doctor and uh he he started aa probably somewhere around 1949 or 1950 so i had not a- related to me though my mom tells used to tell me that i reminded her of him a well. lot she could have gone to any of the meetings and said that and found that a lot of people in there that probably reminded her. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. As so I had a buddy and he was sober, gosh, 30 something years. And, and he made a comment one time and I thought it was really good. He said, you know, genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. That, that yes, which I thought that, that's was very true. Yeah. And, and th- to be a successful drinker and drug drug user, you just have to surround yourself with people doing the same shit. <laughs> that's all you got to do it's right, easy right you know and the bars in columbus ohio some of them are still existing and some of those people are still sitting on the same bar stools that they were sitting on when i left there 21 years ago you know you just you just are become part of that environment and it's that right. way in every city yeah you know it's that way in new york city it's that way in la hmm. you just surround yourself with those people and it's really easy to do yeah you don't have to apologize there's no excuses there's no nothing you're all fucked up yeah so it's really, just, you're yeah. a member of the same club you know there's no exactly. yeah there's no excuses exactly. yeah wow yeah. man what a story thank you very much for sharing what oh, no. um what would you say is i i mean i'm sure this list is infinitely long but what were the what are the top one or two things that regaining so you know that becoming sober has like not given you but that you've been able to change about yourself or feel differently about yourself what are the the you know the um first and foremost i'm i'm able to i'm i'm able to successfully have um good relationships with people, you know, uh, people that, you know, you go, when you're, when you're an alcoholic, you do a lot of, um, isolating and, uh, you know, not that I don't still isolate. I still do a little bit. Um, and I procrastinate a little bit, but not near as bad as I used to. Uh, my, my relationships have constantly got it gotten better. Um, and when, the, when there's problems now, I deal with them much, much better. Um, so better coping I, skills. 
co- better coping skills. Thank you. Um, I like myself better. I, I, you know, I'm the hardest, you know, I'm one of those people that have, I've got a huge ego and a huge inferiority complex at the same time. Um, Interesting. the ego, you know, a lot of alcoholics do actually, um, the, the ego part, you know, I shove that away quite a bit. It can show its scary head every now and then if it needs to. If I get backed against a wall just a little too much, sometimes, sure. <laughs> sometimes it will. Um, and and it and it did it did in my, you know, in my, the last Seeger tour I did, my ego definitely got in my way quite a bit with that. Uh, not this one that I'm on now, but the the, the past one when I that I didn't finish. Um, and. Uh, You know, it, it's liking myself is probably it's almost the most important thing, because if I like myself, then I tend to like everybody else. You know, if I'm in a good mood, then everybody else is in a good mood. If I'm in a shitty mood, I was able to put everybody else in the room or around me in a shitty mood, too. And um, and, and that's because of my lack of confidence in myself. Hmm. Um and not that I'm Joe confident all the time now. I, I, I'm not. If I'm in a comfortable situation, then, yeah, I've got a lot of confidence. If I'm in an uncomfortable situation, then not so much. Hmm. But, uh, but the fact that I can, I can look myself in the face every day and go, you know, you're being the best guy that you can be, uh, that, that, that's, that's probably the thing that I've learned, that I've gained the most out of this. What more can you do? Yeah, that's you know? true. Yeah. If that's what, if you could say that you're fucking doing great, like yeah, you, you know, know I, seriously, I don't love like myself every day, but I cope with myself a lot better. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny uh, because <laughs> I still make stupid mistakes, and I still say stupid shit now and then. <laughs> I think everybody does, you know. I mean, oh yeah, that's part of life. Part of life. Yeah, man. Thank you for sharing your story. I, I really, really appreciate that. Let's uh, talk about probably something you are one of the experts in of anybody I've ever spoken to. Gear. <laughs> okay your other addiction. your other addiction that's right man you <laughs> took the words right out of my mouth so like w- what's your go-to guitar right now wow that's always a hard question to answer for me because i don't really get married to guitars very much um you know back in the rosy days uh and even in the gods you know in the rosy days me and the other guitar player ed ed I mean, we were carrying 20, 30 guitars on the road with us sometimes. No. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're both, uh, we both we both have a problem with that. And, you know, I used to like to switch guitars almost every song and stuff. And with Seeger, if you see the old old uh, videos that I'm, that I'm on um, on YouTube, you'll see me change guitars a lot. But it's not so much because of that. It's because of different tunings and capos and things like that. You know, they all have a purpose. It's not just a whim. Sure. Um when when we were out the last time, uh, I was favoring. Um, well, first off, uh, my my all time favorite guitar is a 1971 Black Les Paul Custom that I've had for a long, long time. I knew you were a humbucker guy. I just knew. Yeah, that. I am. Yeah, I, I am. It. Well, to a point. Yeah. Um, its nickname is the Meat. The Meat, and it's a set. Yeah. What did you say it was? A 70. It's a 1971 Black Les Paul Custom. Wow, is that? Are you the original owner on that, or is it? No, 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 no. I bought it in. I'm going to say seventy five or so, seventy six, seventy five, seventy six. Um, it's had a gazillion different pickups in it. It's been refretted several times. Um, I probably changed the hardware because I, I I have acidic sweat, so I go through. You know, I eat yeah. metal, um, and uh, I, I used it. I used it the 2006 and 7, or 5 and 6, and 11 Seeger tours, but I don't like taking it out on the road anymore because I just don't yeah. want anything to happen to it. Sure. Um, just because I've had it for so long. And, and and honestly, it's not the lightest Les Paul on earth. It's oh, probably, shit. That's you know, hell yeah. It's probably, you know, 10 and ten and a little change pounds, That's which a, is heavy for a Les Paul. Really but heavy. But it's, it's still a great, it's still my go-to guitar. Um the other one that I've had for not quite as long as that, or but almost as long as a, a 1956. I, I'm a I'm a real Les Paul Junior aficionado, if you will. I've owned hundreds of them. Uh, 
That's a, that's a single core. That's a that, excuse me. That's a one pickup guitar, correct? Yeah, a one single P90. Yeah, right. Yeah, I love single P90 guitars. I have a lot of them. That's is that that's the one Leslie. What's what Leslie West used to play? Correct. That's why yeah. I use. Yeah. Oh, yeah. what a what a. You know, I was referred to him recently. I'm just hoping that this goes through. I'd love to get him on this show. Oh He's, yeah, that would be great, man. I love Leslie. I'm a huge, huge Leslie West fan, and that's exactly why I think. I love Les Paul Juniors, but I've got a 56 that I bought. Oh, wow. In 19, I bought this guitar, and it was the beginning of Rosie. So it had to be 80 or 81. I bought this guitar in Toledo, Ohio for 200 bucks. Holy um, crap. Which, That's well, a that best was actually the going rate. When I first started, when I when I worked at Whitey Lunzar's right out of high school, I was buying Les Paul Juniors at that shop for like 80 bucks. Um, when I when I first okay. joined the Gods, I had I had six Les Paul Juniors. I had three double cutaways and three single cutaways. Not one of them I paid more than eighty dollars for. What do those but, go for now? Um, thirty five hundred bucks. Oh no, no. Well, for one that's been broken, yeah. Uh, oh wow. No, they're you know a really really nice one can bring six to six to eight thousand bucks in an in a original finish. Um, Average price for one these days is probably somewhere between four and five thousand. The TV, the yellow ones, yeah. the TV finish ones, go for more. Those are the cool looking ones, man. They, they are. I, I've owned a lot of those. I actually, I had one that I um, that uh, Joe Strummer ended up with many, many, many years ago. That's funny. Um, then I sold one to uh, when I still had Cowtown. Um, Billy Joe Armstrong was buying every junior he could find. And I think I, I sold him a TV yellow one at the time. And that's right at the peak of guitar, you know, values, probably somewhere around 2005, 2006. And I sold him a TV junior for the better part of 20,000 bucks. Holy crap. Insane. They're, they're still worth 10 to 12 in nice condition. Wow. Uh, but, uh, you know, regular old cherry double cut, four to 5,000 bucks if it's not jacked up, you know. Still way too much for a $129 guitar. Yeah. But, uh, I, I the one that the 56 that I have has been through the ringer and it actually as at a friend of mine's in Ohio right now having the neck reset on it because over the years it's gotten like like old Martins do um, the it's the neck is sinking into the body a little bit and the bridge <laughs> is all the way down to the body and I can't get the action low enough so I'm having somebody that I trust very much uh, reset the neck on it I'm, I'm hoping to have it back if we go back out this this year. And you'll take that on the road, that 56. That one I would. The other the other nicer ones that I have, I don't want to take yeah. on the road. This one's been refretted with bigger frets. Okay. It's all utility. You know, it's got Grovers on it. And, you know, it's just a great utility. Guitar. Sure, sure. So, yeah. Wow. But let me ask you this. So I I've, I really like the sound of like a, a vintage Marshall, like a 50 watt, 69, yeah. 70, 71. Yep. Great heads. Now. Yeah. They all, they make a lot. There's a lot of guys boutique shops now making brand new ones that mimic them, and I'm assuming yeah. some of these are really good because the guys that are telling me about these are professional players. Okay, so uh, am I better off if I wanted to buy that because they cost the same thing? You're going to pay like twenty two thousand to twenty five hundred whether you're buying the original or whether you're buying the boutique one. Mm -hmm. What do, what's the better decision? You being um, you should know this, or I would you first, should have first off, some insight. First off, all, all amplifiers, especially older ones, are not created equal. I've owned as many terrible sounding Plexi Marshall heads as I have great sounding Plexi Marshall heads. Okay. Um, they didn't. The the reason for that is one of the reasons for that is, you know, it's just like Fender. They just picked up parts that they had, and you know, and they threw them in there. There was no. Uh, no really measuring of the value, the tolerances of the values of the of the components, you know, the capacitors and things like that, and and tubes. Um, if you can find a, you know, rather than like like for example, the, the most of the or a lot of the new model 1987, which would be like a 71 small box 50 watt head, I played a lot of those that sound freaking awesome. They really do, and you know, with changing tubes and. And a couple other little things in there, and 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 making the tolerances closer, you can get them to sound great. Now, if you can buy a seventy-one small box fifty watt Marshall for around the same price, I would do that. And there, and but you know, 
but have it gone through. Okay, um, so if I, as, you prefer the older, the vintage one, as opposed well, to the new boutique one, I do for find for a finan- for financially. I do, you know, if if it's if it's apples and oranges as far as ba- as far as the the price of one goes, then you buy the older one because it's going to go up in value. You know, it's going to appreciate in value. Okay, now, but, th- but there is maintenance that go. You know, if it hasn't been already maintained, it's going to need some stuff. But if you keep them properly maintained, you're you're good. You know, it's just like you know buying a car and putting new tires on it and changing your oil. You know, it's all that kind of stuff. But yeah, from a value standpoint, it's always better to buy the old one if it's if it's the same. You know, same same. Qual- so how would I know? So if I'm buying it online, I have to just buy it from someone that is like known by a guy like you or a guy like a Greg Martin from the Kentucky Headhunters or guys that yeah somebody I know that. A professional musician who's got a guy that he works with who's reputable all the time. Absolutely. Or, you know, if it's not that, you got you need a return policy, you know. Right, uh, right, old, right. Older amps, suspect, newer amps, it doesn't bother me to buy stuff online sure. you know, like that too much. But older amps, yeah, because they, man, they vary. You know, I, I did a test at Cowtown a long, long, long time ago. I had four matching 65 or 66 Super Reverbs. They all had the same speakers. Um they were all, you know, pretty much original. All four of those amps lined up could not have sounded more different. Wow. And it's because, the, you know, the, the tolerances in, in the parts, you know, plus, minus 5, 10, 15 percent, man, that makes all the difference in the world. But let me ask you, but, did but, they sound good? Did they all four sound good or did one or two of them sound, hey, this is not so good? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they all sound different and some of them not as good as others. Okay. Okay. You know, and I've had, I've had, you know, I've even had some newer amps, you know, like that, that one will sound really, really good. And the other one just doesn't mm-hmm. have it for some reason, but you can always send them to somebody. You know, I, I know a lot of great amp techs out there and most stuff can be, you know, wrangled back into, wrangled back into shape. Mm, sure. Sure. You know, it's interesting. I had, See that 335 behind me, right? So yeah. I bought that in Nashville, and a guy named John Presti, I don't know if you know him, he's um, Tim McGraw's guitar tech. He helped me get it and set it up. And man, when when you have a guy like that set up your guitar versus even a really good like lo- local luthier, wow, yeah. it's just, I didn't realize how much of a difference that can make. Absolutely can make a big difference. Um you know, it's and and the funny thing is, is everybody's everybody's different. You know, I played some some, uh, you know, famous guys guitars. And I, I think to myself, how the fuck can you play this thing? You know, I'm I, I'm actually really particular about my stuff. And I, I do other than refrets, which which I know how to do, but don't like to do. Haven't done one in, in, in decades. But um, other than that. I work on almost all my own stuff. Um, you know, my, my guitar tech, Andy uh, Harrison, who's out with, uh, uh, he didn't do the Seeger tour with us because uh, he's working with Cheryl Crow full time. Um, actually, he's going to be here tomorrow. I let him mess with some of my stuff, you know. But other than that, I like I like, I like like setting up my own guitars. Right. You know, I have a personal way that I like them to be and. You know, and I've been doing it long enough that I know, that yeah. I know how to do it. Yeah. It's second hand for you, I'm sure. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. So the the, the Les Paul Custom seventy one and the fifty six yeah, Les and, Paul and Junior the, and the Junior. But the last Seeger tour, um, I, I you know I wasn't playing a lot of electric. Uh, I was playing far more acoustic than electric. But my my main go to guitar for the past probably the past few years has been a, a Tom Anderson. It's called a Mongrel. Um, is, which that, is, is that like the bulldog? Like the? Uh... No, it's a. Uh, it is a. Um, it's a tele body with like a okay. Strat Electronics. Okay. Strat Guard Strat Electronics. They actually made. They actually made that for me. Um, oh, so you had, you, had, you had that custom done. Well, they made. It's a model now. Okay. Um, I I talked to Roy there who had me talk to Tom. He goes, why do you want to do this? I go, well, because I don't really love Strat bodies, but I, I love Tele bodies, but I like the Strat electronic stuff mm. because that was the right answer. So they decided to make it for me. The, the, if you go on the Anderson website, the one that they, the first one they show on there is the guitar that I have. Oh, cool. Um, 
And then they wanted a name, you know, they go, well, what should we call this? Of course, I wanted them to call it the Chattacaster. But, uh, <laughs> they, they didn't go for it. So they decided to call it the Mongrel, which is ironic. Bob Seeger from a long time ago has an album. An album, because, Mon- yeah, Mongrel, I have that album. But they had really no old. idea. They it's did a- not know that at all. That's really yeah. old, that record. Yeah, it's a great record. Though. Yeah. There's a song on there called Lucifer that's one of my favorite Bob Seeger songs. But... Um, they uh, they called it the mongrel and they made it a model and there used to be it used to the, on the website it used to be the mongrel story on there and I got full props on there for them making that guitar and then after I wasn't playing with after I wasn't playing with Bob again uh, for like three years that that story's off of there now so uh, it's, uh, but but that's how the guitar came about and that's that's, cool. that's kind of my you know. Um, when I went back to uh, to Ohio to rehearse uh, with my with my my band back there before the Seeger tour came up, I decided not to take a plethora of guitars with me. I, I have some guitars I keep there anyway. Hmm. Um, I have a whole bunch of gear that I keep in Ohio, but um, and and one of the other guys that plays the other guy that plays guitar in that band has a lot of guitars too. But I decided for once in my life I'm just taking one guitar with me. And so I took the mongrel with me, and that's the one I used all through the rehearsals. So I could I could use that guitar for anything. Do you still have family so. left in Ohio? Uh, no, no. My mom lives in Florida. Uh, my sister. Where is she? Well, where my sister? East my Coast sister or in, West Coast? Huh? Is she on the East Coast or the West Coast? Uh, she's in Naples. Okay. She's on West Coast. Right, right. Um, my uh, my sister just moved back to Ohio, um, but she hasn't lived there for eons. She she was like. Uh, a, a lifetime college student for a long time, and uh, she's six years younger than me. But she's a she's a professor at Kent State now. Oh, cool! Um, so she finally got her doctorate a couple of years ago, and um, she's educated in very a lot of things. So she's the brains of the family. Uh, so yeah, she's back in Ohio, and you know I haven't seen her since she moved back there, though. Gotcha. I'm going to ask you three more questions, Mark, because if if I didn't, we could literally talk for about seven hours and then we could. S- still this not could become the March hat. Show. It, it could be so, very easily. Sorry about I, that. I, I, I could, no, it's all good, man. You're, you're interesting. <laughs> so I don't mind where it's problem is when it's like, you know, you know, but that's not the case here. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Believe me. You know, you, you probably, by the time that, by the time you air this and even edit it, I probably five minutes into it, they're going to be going. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. This is good stuff. Are you kidding me? Um, I have a question. Tell me something about yourself. People would either be surprised to hear or would find it a little odd. I think we covered most of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music? Wow. Um, I used to collect Harleys for a while or motorcycles in general. You know, I had a lot of motorcycles, um, Harleys, Indians, you know, then some of the other makers. You know, like uh, American Iron Horse and stuff like that. I don't do that anymore because it takes up too much space and the insurance costs too much. Mm, sure. Uh, so, so I quit doing that. Um, hold on, I unplug myself again. No, it's all good. I have to tell everybody listening that, um, and I think I said this early, but Mark is looks such the rock and roll dude. Like you could see this guy <laughs> with his long hair, you know, rolling down the street with a freaking set of. Ray Bans on and his hair flowing on a Harley with a like a black leather jacket and leather boots, man. Oh, there you go. That's Especially very... with the I usually, you know, it's funny during usually during the winter I just don't shave. Okay. You know, I just let the beard grow out. And this year, this year I decided to go just with the uh, the Wolf Blitzer beard. Yeah, it's uh, very so, trim and neat, actually. You know, doing good um, there. But uh, uh, you know, I yeah, I used to I ride and collect motorcycles. Um, uh, other than that, I don't really have, you know, I wish I could, uh, I, I wish I could be more exciting. My wife and I, um, uh, for a couple of years, we were doing hot yoga several times a week. Um, then about a year ago, I broke one of my toes and I had to stop and I haven't been back and I, I need to go back. But, you know, I, I, I'm a real homebody. Mm. Um, I just like hanging out at the house uh, you know, I, I buy and sell guitars for a hobby still, hmm. um, you know, and I do work around the house, uh, and kind of handy with some stuff or, or if I'm not, I just go on YouTube and learn how to do it. Yeah. yeah. 
last week I just changed the uh, I changed the motor on my pool pump myself. Just from YouTube. Yep. It's and amazing saved how much a bunch cool, of money. Yeah, it's yep. amazing how much cool stuff is on there, man. So, uh, you know, that that's I wish I had something exciting to tell you, but I don't. It's all good, man. No, that's that's totally cool. Um what's the best advice you've ever been given? And who gave it to you, if you remember it? Shut up and play, Drew Abbott. There you go. Yeah, that's. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna put that down when you're when you're when this uh, interview gets published. That's what it's gonna say. Shut up and play. That's awesome. Yep. <laughs> and, and the last question is: Over the last ten years, what's been the biggest change in your personality? Um. You know, we I, we we kind of covered that a little bit, but it, it it's. I think it's it's uh, liking myself and 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 caring about other people's feelings, you know, and uh, and 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 being responsible for others besides myself. Yeah, that's pretty deep. I I I, because I think correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not speaking out of experience here but as I understand it narcissism is a pretty big demon for addicts absolutely and, a- absolutely and yeah it's, it's, well and like I said but it, once again it comes along with that inferiority complex which fucks you all up what it makes you do is your ego starts you're, you're feeling inferior you know about something which sometimes comes off as somebody attacking you or, or whatever, whatever's making you feel that way. And your ego makes you act on that. Yeah. And, and it just becomes a, I mean, it just becomes a bad, bad situation for you and everybody else around you. Sure, man. Totally. You know? Well, those are some good changes, man. And I'm really happy for you because those are all positive things, man. I've I mean, become, a, I'm sorry. I've become a better listener too. <laughs> that's great. You know, those, that's, those are all great, man. I'm really uh, glad you're getting to experience that. Um, I cannot thank you enough for your time, man. You're just an awesome guy. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Let me tell people where they could find you because you're going to be doing a a Gods and Rosie reunion tour. So if you want to check out Mark, first of all, go on YouTube, look up Mark Chatfield, C-H-A-T-F-I-E-L-D, and it's Mark, M-A-R-K. Uh, and you can see him uh, doing stuff with Seeger, Bob Seeger. And the gods, G O D Z and Rosie. And now, if you go to facebook.com forward slash gods and roses, G O D Z N Rosies, R O S I E S, that's a combination of the gods and Rosie. And you guys are going to be doing a little concert up in Columbus this year? Yeah, as soon as we suss out what's going on with uh, with, with Bob and and what dates may or may not be, then I can you know get get back moving on that. We've postponed because of that tour, and and we'll continue to be postponed until I know what's going on. Absolutely. <laughs> Any final words of wisdom, man? I really appreciate everything. Um. Wow, words of wisdom. Um. Listen to live music. Go listen to live music. Support your local live music. Support your local live music. Very good, man. That's you know. I think it's becoming I, a thing of the past, and that that makes me that makes me very sad. You know yeah. that you know what? Not not that I you need to say this, but Columbus, Ohio, has always had one of the best live local music scenes in the United States, and I've been I've been around you've been all United. over, yeah. Yeah, I mean Austin's pretty good. Um, on, in Columbus on a Thursday night, you can go see 20 bands play, you know, 20, 25 bands. But even that's changing. Yeah. Um, the, the good thing is, is, you know, people are changing, you know, they're, they're changing. And but the venues are going away, which is bad. But the smart thing that some people are doing is they're let they're starting up, especially on the weekdays. They're starting bands up early. Well, and on the weekends, when we do when we started doing when we kept doing the or continued on with the Rosie shows, we were getting done at 11 o'clock at night because people that are our age don't yeah. want to go out and stay out till two in the morning, especially right. on a weeknight. But the smart people 
They do like matinee shows now. You want people to come out after work. You start a band at six o'clock or seven o'clock and you're out of there by nine or ten o'clock. And you know, that's just the way it is now. The 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 two AM rock crowd is gone. Yeah. We are gone and we're grown up now. Yes. And, and we're all too old to stay out that late. And the new kids, the new people don't do that. Yeah. They yeah. just don't want any part of it. Well, so. and, the, and the music isn't around that style of music. It's more club stuff, I think. Well, yeah, the only on place that. that exists really is here, you know, and it's the, you know, it's the $200,000 a night DJs. Oh, yeah, man. I couldn't believe that. I read an article on it. That's, oh, my God. Steve Akoy and Tiesto, the, the money those guys are pulling in is insane. I know. And when you think uh, the DJs we used to listen to on the radio, and you can't, it's, yeah. not, it's not apples and apples, but, you know. It's a yeah. different world now, man. Oh, yeah. Big well, listen, time. Mark, I can't thank you enough, man. You're a super nice guy. I'm glad we got to connect. Um, hang on here. Let me just say goodbye. Everybody, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks again so much to Mark Chatfield for spending time with us. I certainly appreciate it. I'm looking forward to this dropping and talking more to Mark. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes along with some cool stuff for guitar players. Now, be nice. Go play a guitar. And most important, have fun. Till next time, peace and love, and I am out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Music.